our last speaker for today, before we close out with the video, is John Illingsworth. Uh, born and bred in Newport, he's a passionate filmmaker and historian. Uh, let's welcome John up to introduce his latest work. Uh, two years ago, I commenced a series of videos called A History of Pitwater. Despite a lack of funding, the scope's ambitious. In the first episode, Discovery runs for 37 minutes. It covers the first two years of European settlement in Australia with particular reference to Pitwater and Broken Bay. As soon after Discovery was, was published, I joined with a group of volunteers who were working to undercover the World War II fortifications at West Head. Because I couldn't ask them to wait for a couple more years while I got the rest of my series together, I had to jump ahead and make West Head Fortress, which is part four. Later on, I'll go back and do parts two and three. <laughs> now, West Head Fortress has been published, but, even more inf but more information keeps on coming in. So it's going to be updated and reinvigorated. Uh, it'll be accompanied, when it's, when it's updated, it will be accompanied by part five, which will be Pitwater's War, and the two things together should detail all of World War II and Pitwater. And that'll be about two hours of screen time. Uh, this presentation shows how a, a community of dedicated and resourceful volunteers can produce something that's worthwhile. I hope you enjoy it. Film or video making is very different today compared to 30 or 40 years ago. A modern filmmaker is no longer constricted by the enormous cost of film stock and processing because digital video costs nothing. And whereas state-of-the-art technology in the 1980s meant heavier equipment with correspondingly large crews, today a one kilogram video camera that costs less than $2,000 has features that match and indeed exceed cameras that used to cost as much as $100,000. Filmmaking today is cheaper, lighter and faster and this enables the making of films that would previously have been uneconomic. The films I make seek to inform the local community. They're not commercially oriented, but I try to achieve a quality that would be commercially acceptable. These films have no budget. Payment for a sound studio or an aircraft is simply out of the question, just as it is for music royalties or historical film clips. There simply is no money, but it's amazing what can be done. For this film, the centrepiece is the recollection of a 91-year young man named Bluey Mercer. Bluey installed the guns at Westhead in 1940 and 1941. By now, we've moved around a little bit. We're watching only the moving platform. Never mind about the counterweight until all of a sudden Major Garling realised that. But the history of Westhead begins in 1831 and it's complex. Now with history, you can't just jump in to show an item of interest. You have to establish the historical context and this takes time, screen time. Screen time demands attractive visuals. People interested in this project arranged for an experimental aircraft to be flown down from Queensland with an eye to filming from it. Today's exercise was the, the cinematography part of the Westhead Awareness Team which is a voluntary group of people uh, exposing the World War II gun emplacements, the gun battery at, at West Head on Broken Bay in Pitwater. Being a seaplane, it could legally fly below 500 feet. But there was a cyclone, and when the plane finally arrived, there was just a single day available for shooting. Good luck saw fine weather, but the wind was gusting to 50 kilometres, which meant bumps. Well, the bumps were so bad that my handheld footage was unusable. It was a disaster, but a couple of action cameras mounted externally on the aircraft saved the day. I decided to use this footage as visual filler for a necessarily lengthy narration. But what about sound? The only track I have is of wind whistling past the aircraft. Well, I really want to use a particular piece of music. The scene will be dominated by the length of the narrative, but if I'm to use this piece of music, I can't cut it short, the piece has to play to completion. The music will ultimately dominate the timing. All elements have to be paced and pitched so that a crescendo is reached as we fly past West Head. After 1831, all Crown land was sold at public auction. 
It was just at the point of systemic change in 1831 that the land around Westhead was selected by a young Irish immigrant, Alexander Stuart Waddell. Waddell claimed to have capital sufficient to qualify for the grant, but suspicions about just whose capital it really was saw the grant reduced from the 2,560 acres applied for to just 640 acres, or one square mile. This surveyor's field book, dated 1832, shows Waddell's selection, along with several others in Pitwater. As it happens, Waddell never took his selection up, and after he left the colony, it was instead granted to the pastoralist William Lawson of Blue Mountains Crossing fame. The deed to Waddell's land, as issued to Lawson in 1834, described it as commencing at a marked tree north of Great Mackerel Beach and near West Head, and bounded on the south by a line west, 140 changed to Broken Bay, and on the west and north by the waters of that bay, back to the Mark Tree aforesaid. The Mark Tree was close to what was later named Resolute Beach, the place where Governor Philip had first landed in Pitwater. Westhead Fortress actually runs for 52 minutes, far longer than the time allotted for this brief discussion, but the short film that follows gives a good idea of what the fortifications look like today. Access to the site is difficult, arduous and potentially dangerous. There are steep cliffs, loose scree and many large boulders that appear ready to topple. We made this film so you can see what's down there without effort or risk. The graphic shows the fortifications at West Head as they were in 1941. Note the near vertical railway running from the top of the cliff almost down to the sea. Materials, guns and munitions all went down this railway at an inclination of 50 degrees. At the bottom, a horizontal railway running from left to right serves the gun just below the railway at the letter 3. At the right hand end of the railway is the second gun, marked by the letter 4. Almost directly above this gun is the battery observation post, marked by the letters 5 and 6. The battery observation post housed the signalers, officers, assistants, plotters and searchlight operators. Unusually, this one had two levels. The searchlight operators occupied the upper level. They had voice communication to the first level, where there was an officer who worked a depression rangefinder. The height of the gun above sea level formed the vertical side of a right angle triangle, and this was a constant known figure. The measured angle of depression of a seaborne target gave the hypotenuse. Simple trigonometry thus enabled calculation of the triangle base, and this gave the range. Orders came for sailing somewhere over there, all confined to There was also an inclination officer who worked out the speed and angle of the approaching target. When the calculations all came together, the battery commander telephoned his instructions through to the loudspeakers in the back of the gun position. Properly calculated, bearing, range and angle of offset brought the ship and the round together. Because searchlights attract enemy fire, they were only switched on for two brackets of 30 seconds, after the round was fired and just before the round was about to hit the target. This was sufficient for the battery commander to make any necessary corrections. Wait where that lantern softly gleams, your sweet face sees. This is the number two gun emplacement. The huge iron object is the gun pedestal. It weighs seven tons and was lowered down the vertical railway and then transported along the horizontal railway. Men levered it into position with crowbars, planks of wood and wooden rollers. It's not, it's not there now, but the circular hole you see was covered by a rotating tracking plate. It was bolted to the top of the pedestal and the gun sat on top of that. This enabled the gun to swivel left and right. We knew that the magazine had been excavated into the hillside, but nevertheless, finding it was a surprise. Bless all the sergeants and W01s. Bless all the corporals and their thinking sons, cause we're saying goodbye to them all. Look at this when you're ready. To their billets they crawl. You'll get no promotion this side of the ocean, so cheer up, my lads.
An enormous boulder, several tons in weight, has recently crashed down onto the magazine roof, smashing the heavily reinforced concrete. I'm now walking along the horizontal railway towards the number one gun emplacement, and Jeff is looking at the remains of a gantry that hoisted the gun into place. We're gonna hang out the washing on the Siegfried line. Have you any? Here's the number one gun pedestal. We're gonna hang the view's not bad either. Washing on the Siegfried line, cause the washing day is here. Because the climb out is so arduous, we've taken a shortcut up the 50 degree vertical railway. Wish me luck as you wave. You wouldn't do this without the rope. Quite halfway yet, but it's been a hell of a climb. I can't imagine these guys, you know, uh, 68 years ago, chopping through this. And just down there further, there are, there are, there, there is still a an RSJ that would have held a, a sleeper, and there are marks all the way up showing where the RSJs and the sleepers were. Not much remaining of that though. Today, it's hard to imagine the very real threat that Japan and Germany posed to Australia in 1940, but Bluey Mercer recalls it vividly. But nonetheless, let's go back a little bit to 1940. It's well recorded in 1940 that uh, just over the horizon, not far out, uh, the German Navy was, was really quite busy and they were playing havoc in the shipping lanes off the, off the coast. Uh, it, it has been not officially confirmed, but the first ship to be sunk on the Australian on the Australian coastline on the Australian coastline uh, during the war was uh, just off Cooktown, and it hit a mine which had been laid by a, a German uh, auxiliary cruiser by name of Penguin. Penguin was operating out there and had had a whole lot of support in a, in a whole lot of um, merchant vessels, uh, armed merchant ships that were there to give it support and raid the uh, various ships that were going up and down up and down the coast. When that, when that occurred, of course, it created a bit of a stir in the people that were responsible for maintaining the safety of Australia. Now, much of the military history of West Head has been lost. Moreover, by 2010, vegetation hid what structures remained. The West Head Awareness Team set about revealing these structures and researching the lost history. Here, what members are examining an observation bunker overlooking Pitwater. I bet those trees weren't there when they were here because you can get a tremendous view right out over between Barron Joey and uh, what is it, Newport, um, Palm Beach, and out to Broken Bay itself. And this was a, an area that would have been uh, part of the garrison battalion's responsibilities to mount coast watches to provide early warning of shipping movements and uh, also to back up the defence of the submarine net. John, the uh, timber insets, top and bottom, to mount the uh, windows, the shutters, and uh, reinforcing bar to anchor camouflage and to tie things down that might be needed. Interestingly enough, though, that the door is at the front, facing the enemy, which <laughs> <laughs> which meant that it was never expected to have to fight from it because you want the door at the side or rear as an escape. On top of the roof of this, uh, of this um, observation post, there's a boulder which, mu which must weigh at least 10 tonnes, which has obviously come down since the, um, since the post was built. To date, it's been difficult to get video of West Head Fortress. In the air, we had severe turbulence. And on land, you can't really get far enough back to see all of the installations together. That's why the earlier segment showed you a graphic. We've tried from the water once, but again, the platform was unstable. Now we're going to try from the water again, this time from a large catamaran. We also have a new camera, which has a built-in gyro-controlled stabilisation system. As we pass the remains of the makeshift wharf that once serviced the West Head battery, we can see on the rock in the foreground concrete that used to support the wharf platform on the outer edge and on the large rock on the shoreline behind it we can see concrete that held the other end of the platform. 
Beyond that, about 40 metres inland, you can see another bunker that's guarding this entrance point. But what we're really here for today is that we have a new Watt volunteer, a drone pilot. And with his help, we hope to get an entirely new perspective for this dramatic location. OK, so you're going to come behind me, OK? Yeah. You're going to tell me where you want me to go. OK, should be all. Let's go. I'll come back in. Wait, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come in your hand. Oh, oh man! Oh, I can see this, man.